But getting back to outriggers for um, a, a moment to see the relationship, uh, with the New York Times uh, headquarters, this building is basically an uh, all steel building with outriggers, and the, typically the outriggers are uh, every, so many floors, and then they penetrate the core, which is somewhat of a uh, disadvantage, but then they help bring, bring back the, um, uh, bring back the, uh, uh, the building and minimize the deflections. But with the New York Times building, we eliminated some of the cross bracing on the inside of the uh, building uh, through the core of the outriggers and put it on the, uh, uh, the outside thereby getting an outrigger type building uh, with minimizing uh, the interference on the, uh, uh, in the inside of the core, uh, making it a lot more MEP and owner, uh, uh, owner friendly. So that, that brings us back to the, um, uh, brings us back to the Chicago Spire. Uh, and with the Spire, I'd like to just quickly explain the structural system in light of uh, the evolution of uh, structural systems. And I, I could add 3,000 more projects here to give a complete detailed evolution of, of structural systems. Uh, so, uh, but that's not possible uh, because of David's bell. Uh, but the, the, uh, the spire is basically, basically a concrete core, steel structure, columns which essentially go straight down, some are uh, uh, at certain, uh, certain angles, and then the scalloped floor, which also helps in breaking up vortex shedding, the scalloped floor just twists a little bit, uh, a degree or so every floor, and that's how you get the twist. And you can kind of see on this uh, floor plate how each floor is just uh, uh, twisted a little bit. Right. And that gives you this uh, twist that uh, 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 co co comes down and gives you the architecture of the building and it was Santiago Calatrava's way of wanting a design that he felt really represented both engineering and, uh, uh, and, and interesting architecture and minimizing wind, uh, wind forces. But one of the interesting things is that we have a concrete core and what was developed was this circular outrigger. This circular outrigger picks up all the columns. By picking up all the columns, we get a, uh, a almost tube-like uh, behavior where all of the columns on the outside are participating in resisting the, uh, uh, the, the wind loads. And it's done in a way, think of it as a sleeve that's tight around the, uh, the core. And there are no penetrations of the outrigger going through the, uh, through the core. And in this analysis uh, uh, um, figure here, uh, the various different colors basically show that all of the columns and all of the outside are being activated to some extent, similar to the way a tube works, um, regardless of the wind in, the, uh, in any direction. So I think the spire wound up having somewhat of a tube-like uh, uh, behavior, and we got the advantages uh, of that, uh, plus we had the outriggers allowing us uh, with a core, uh, allowing us to have wider spacing on the outside, and we eliminated the uh, 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 the uh, bracing going uh, uh, through the uh, uh, through the core. So that was all fine and well, and then uh, Santiago Calatrava said, "You know, I really want to open up the lobby." And he had the columns had to come down, and we had to slant them out, go from 21 columns to uh, uh, seven foundation uh, pickup points on the caissons, which developed a whole new group of uh, innovative ideas in steel uh, 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 detailing for major uh, uh, connections. So there was a lot that was learned from that that we think can be used on, uh, on other, um, other, other projects. Okay. Now... The wind tunnel testing. I have about five more minutes. <laughs> the wind tunnel testing was fascinating, the work we did with uh, RWDI, and there was this back and forth looking at what the twist should be on the building from both an architectural point of view 
and from an, an engineering and wind point of view. So a lot of studies were done, and this uh, is an example of one of the earlier models uh, where you really get a sense of the uh, twist in the spire. And we used three wind tunnel uh, models as we went along, and we did a variety of different wind tunnel tests, uh, uh, culminating with an aero uh, elastic test. And all of the models showed that with this uh, twisting and, and, and tapering, we were getting loads that were about 75% of what would be required by the uh, Chicago uh, 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 code. Uh, the models also showed as we put more and more twist in it, okay, the second two models, the accelerations were significantly less compared to the accelerations of the uh, first model, which had less twist at the, at the top. But this very tall, slender building had an aspect ratio, no equations, just a couple of charts, don't panic. Okay. This, uh, this had an, uh, 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 an aspect ratio of about, uh, uh, of about 12. It's uh, quite a, uh, 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 a slender uh, building. And it has a period of, for those of you who are into periods, it has a period of about 18, the time it takes to sway uh, back and forth, 18 seconds. So what was very interesting with this project, at the 10-year return uh, wind, which is the maximum wind in 10, 10 years, which is the usual criteria we use uh, for comfort, uh, we were in the range of about uh, 15, 16 uh, millijes for, we used 1% damping. We were in the range that would not require adding any damping. And the large period was helping. But for such a high period building, what was happening, when we looked at the one-year return, the maximum wind in one year, and the maximum wind every month, working very closely with our WDI, our wind consultants, it was determined that we felt that this was pretty, pretty high for uh, getting something like seven millijes to 10 millijes that would happen maybe every month or just once, once a year. And, and that's because of the very high period of this building, you can start getting uh, uh, unacceptable levels uh, at, at lower, lower um, uh, uh, speeds. So it was something else that was learned. And that, uh, that gets aggravated if you, the accelerations get aggravated if you have uh, uh, high vortex shedding which shows, which gives you a, a resonance and just a little reminder what the vortex shedding is uh, all about. And this one little curve, just pay attention because it's really very interesting, okay? What this shows, what this shows is that at the lower wind speeds, okay? the lower wind speeds that I just talked about, we were getting more vortex shedding than at the, at the higher wind, wind, wind speeds. And the other thing that was happening that's interesting, you know building has mode shapes, everybody knows that, and typically this is the first and second mode shape, that's just your normal sway of the uh, building. And most buildings, 99% of the buildings, that's all you have to consider when you look at the, the dynamics of the building. But something to be learned here by everybody, with a building of such a high period, and we're seeing more and more buildings with high periods, as you know, the, the, the second and third mode shape, which was this kind of swiggly thing here, was contributing 20 to 30% to the uh, accelerations. Which means, if we have to put a tune mass damper in the building, which we had to for the lower wind speeds, Remember, we put a tune mass damper in for the lower wind speeds, not the higher wind speeds. If we have to do that, we have to address both of these uh, mode shapes to uh, uh, minimize those accelerations.